what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to introduce uh, Nick Lehman, the outgoing dean of the journalism school, has been so successful uh, these last two, 10 years. So this is one of his last acts here. We're going to miss him tremendously. And then after that, he's going to introduce uh, President Bollinger. He'll make a speech. We'll eat dinner then. And then he'll come back, and we'll have a discussion uh, with uh, President Bollinger. Lee. Thanks, Ed, and uh, thanks for being here, everybody. Um, this school has just finished uh, celebrating its centennial, um, and for the hundred years that we're he we've been here, if, if uh, we didn't have this screen, I could point out there's a beautiful oil portrait behind it of our founder, Joseph Pulitzer. Um, and, you know, we have a dual mission here. We're a, a professional school and have turned out uh, leaders in journalism and future leaders uh, for a century, uh, many of whom have wound up temporarily or permanently in Latin America. Um, but also, we're a kind of um, node on the network of journalism worldwide. We were founded to be, try to be, on our good days, we are, uh, one of the places in the world of real significance that can promote values like press freedom uh, and press standards. It's, it's a pleasure that the world looks at us to do this, and it's a responsibility for us. So we're tremendously happy that we're able to perform this convening function uh, yet again these couple of days, and, and thanks to you all for coming here and, and making that possible for us. Um, and we're not going away. The school's going to be here. We're going to be committed to these issues, and we've been uh, deeply committed, thanks in, in substantial part to a bunch of people in this room who work in this building, uh, to the press in Latin America. Um, I want to introduce uh, Lee Bollinger, who is the president of Columbia University. Um, he, I was the first dean here. I think there's 19 deans or something like that, but I was the first one hired by Lee. So we've been through a great adventure together. And uh, the fact that I was the first one hired by Lee is partly the coincidence that when he came in, uh, the deanship of this school was vacant. But it's not all coincidence. He comes from a press family himself um, in small towns in California and Oregon. And uh, in his previous academic career was a First Amendment scholar, a press freedom scholar at, at the University of Michigan, and uh, has published widely on that subject. Um, only a couple of years ago, he somehow managed to find the time as president of a university uh, to write a book about press freedom and launched a, uh, a, a new initiative from his office to promote global press freedom as a kind of fundamental norm of, of world society. Um, it's, it's been wonderful for all of us here uh, to be able to work under Lee's leadership and to know uh, as the denizens of journalism and of a journalism school, that we're in the rare position of having a, a president of the university who um, I think I can say safely tonight, we're first in his hearts among all the parts of the university since they're not here. Um, <laughs> but I think it's actually true maybe. Um, and and uh, to, to have that kind of significance and, and placed on us from uh, such a visionary and capable leader is, is a real privilege. And uh, for us here, I would say, frankly, it's a privilege to be exploited. Um, we need to use uh, President Bollinger as much as we can uh, to advance uh, the values that we hold dear and that he shares. Uh, he'll speak to us now and then again, I think, after the meal. So Lee, please come on up. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Nick. Uh, first of all, Ed, uh, this is a, a really significant meeting. I, I know that uh, you have collected incredible experts and practitioners and 
people from all over uh, South America uh, to talk about these really important issues. And uh, it's not easy to do that. I mean, it's very, very hard. Any of us who have put together meetings or conferences know, uh, knows just how difficult that really is. So this is a great achievement. Um, secondly, I just thank Nick. I mean, Nick has been the superlative dean. Uh, one of the things I recently did over the past uh, three months or so was to chair the uh, search committee for the next dean. And um, uh, it's my appointment, uh, but I wanted to be intimately involved in the process. And it was a great, great process, wonderful faculty who participated. Uh, but the uh, really, I would say, decisive uh, theme of every single meeting was just how great Nick Lemon has been as dean. I mean, it just didn't stop. It was meeting after meeting. And I wanted to say eventually, can't we get on to the future? I mean, uh, but it was, uh, it was a great tribute to Nick. Look, I, um, this is a field I care about enormously. Uh, I think about it every single day. Uh, I think it's enormously important. Uh, I just want to give a, a kind of very quick overview of some of the things that uh, I'm trying to think about, and then uh, we can have dinner. So I'll be very, very quick about this and, and somewhat schematic. Well, let me begin uh, sort of where I have been in my life. I was uh, very happily uh, involved as a First Amendment scholar, and in the United States, uh, that means a separate course or maybe two courses around the subjects of freedom of speech and press, and I was knowing uh, all the cases of the Supreme Court of the United States, and I can talk to you about articles and books and jurisprudence about free speech and free press in the United States. And I was happy. Uh, and I, then there were other people uh, on the law faculty who did international human rights. And I like them too. I mean, they, they were good people and um, they were smart and, and I thought it was an interesting line of work, you know, think about freedom of speech and press in other parts of the world. But none of my course, not a bit of it, uh, involved anything about freedom of press issues in Argentina or Brazil or you know, Europe or China, or it just didn't touch it. And if you look at First Amendment courses all over the country, every law school has a freedom of speech and press class. Uh, every single law school, and you look at the textbooks that are used, you will not find a single mention of major cases or international laws from around the world that deal with, inter with freedom of speech and press. It's all U.S. focused. But of course, the other people who do human rights, as it was called, as it is called and was called, they did know about this. Okay. That was life until about uh, five, eight years ago. And then two things changed in the world, uh, which I think had a deep impact on me, and my hope is it will have a deep impact on other people. And the first change is the growth of the global economy. So the amazing thing about uh, the past decade has been the rise of trade, foreign investment, finance, a global system of economic activity that is literally changing uh, the world. And I think it's absolutely fair to say that the future of any single country now, including this country, uh, despite its dominance as an economic uh, power, the fate of every single country is now tied up, its economy is tied up with the economies of other nations. And there are all kinds of st statistics that one can draw on to make this point, but it is just a major fact of life. The second major change is the invention of uh, the first ever instantaneous global communications technology, so the internet. I mean, that, I started law teaching in the 1970s. There was a major change that happened around that period with the introduction in the 50s of uh, late 40s and 50s of broadcast television and then cable technology. I wrote my very first article about the differential way in which the Supreme Court was thinking about 
that new technology compared to the way it thought about print. And that was major. And now it's major again with a, a new technology. Well, these two things interact. They're not completely separate by any means. But we're living in a world that is being transformed by these two great forces. And they are creating enormous potential, interaction among people, new ideas, opportunities for people, uh, rising wealth standards for really billions of people around the world. Great things are, are possible, and there are also enormous issues. Obviously, environment, climate change. But there are things that we know from the Great Recession that were linked in a global financial world that have to be addressed. There has to be some kind of change in the global economy in order to avoid or minimize the impact of the swings, the manic periods, and the depressed periods. So this has to be dealt with. Then there are issues of water, and there are issues of culture, and there are issues of inequality of income. And we can all list now the great issues that the world faces. And these are issues that cannot be solved by any single country. I mean, one country can't change the problem of climate change. One country can't change the problems uh, of water. These are all things that are now interconnected. So my view is that's a state of affairs that requires people like me and all of us, really, to think about how we create a global public forum. Let's just call it that. It's maybe the, you know, too ambitious a, a concept, put it that way. But a global public forum in which people all over the world can speak to and address the questions that we face now as a result of a integrated and integrated uh, world, interdependent world. We need to be able to talk about these things. That means we need a whole new concept about how we approach this. And to go back to the initial little anecdote about me and the First Amendment community and the international human rights community, it's no longer possible, it's no longer realistic, it's no longer desirable to have those people talking, thinking about human rights and us talking about US, it's now everybody has to talk about the new global public forum or the space in which we're going to talk about these issues. I believe that this is a transformation of conceptual underpinnings uh, that is profound. Uh, that is to say, Human rights are still very, very important. The idea that there is a base, a fundamental line of, of things that people can claim as their own as against any sovereign nation, these are, that's an important concept, obviously, and it will continue. But it's also the case we have very practical problems to solve, discuss, fix. So it has both things now. How do we do this? Well, we have to realize that we're facing a world in which, in which not everybody agrees about openness and freedom of speech in this global public forum, obviously. So we have censorship that happens in different places of the world, especially, uh, of course, with the internet, but elsewhere. And as I like to say to kind of capture this thought, we're now in a world where censorship anywhere is censorship everywhere. And that's really significant, in how we think about it. It's not just, let's get human rights for the people around the world. It's when there's censorship elsewhere, it has a threat to people in our own societies and to every other society. It has it in two ways. One is that we ourselves can get drawn into censorship litigation, let's say, any place around the world. I say something here, it's published around the world, I may end up being sued for defamation any place. I may be sued criminally for invasion of privacy any place. I may be sued for 
uh, subversive speech against the state any place in the world. That's now a realistic possibility, and it's, a, it's actually happening. And the second way in which censorship anywhere is censorship everywhere is when information is denied through censorship in a given part of the world, I need that information in order to address the global problems that we have in the global public forum. So censorship in Brazil or Argentina, let's say, is today like censorship in Tennessee or Oregon or California 50 years ago here. And then we have not just the problem of censorship around the world and its impact on this desire, this need to have a global public forum, but there's also the issue of capacity. Even if we had all censorship removed that was bad, we still would need to talk about how do we get the information that we need. And it's wonderful to see the rise of global media. It's wonderful to see the, uh, the amount of journalism that's happening around the world. It's also deeply distressing to see the closing of foreign bureaus, to see the retraction and retrenchment of major traditional media about coverage of, of the world. I mean, these things are deeply distressing. But even if that had continued the way it was 10 years ago, we would still need more coverage of the world. How are we going to get that? So there are two problems in this logic of we got a global public forum now that we have to protect, we have to stop improper censorship, and we have to develop the capacity. Well, then the question is, uh, questions are how do we do that? What do we look to? I actually think this is not the first time we've been through this uh, in a way. In the United States, going back 100 years, uh, there was no First Amendment as we know it today. No, there had been no Supreme Court case 100 years ago in 1913. The Supreme Court didn't even talk about the First Amendment in, a, in an opinion until 1919. And then it wasn't a good start. A candidate for President of the United States, Eugene Debs, leader of the Socialist Party, was put in jail for a speech he gave uh, praising people who resisted the draft. That was declared illegal by the government. He was sent to jail. He went up to the Supreme Court. A unanimous Supreme Court said, that's not free speech. That's not First Amendment as we know it. He was in jail. It took another decade or two to begin the process of really developing free speech in the United States as we know it today. At that time, every state had its own laws and rules about freedom of speech and press. And it wasn't until really New York Times versus Sullivan that the United States Supreme Court said, we are an integrated society. We are economically a national society. We have issues that are national in scope. The South wants to discriminate against blacks. And that's not something we can just leave to them. That has to be something that, uh, that lives up to national standards. And we're going to take this on in the context of freedom of speech as well. In a, in a case where the New York Times sent a few uh, uh, papers down to Alabama and was sued for libel, and the Supreme Court said, you can't have your own libel rules. We've got to have national standards about this. We have issues that are national. We have an economy that's national. And that's when we really solidified the American jurisprudence we have today. And it was from then until this moment that we developed the most protective uh, uh, jurisprudence for freedom of speech and press of any nation in history, and certainly any nation in the world today. Okay, that's what happened here. Now that has to happen on a global scale because of the interdependence and the global issues. In a way, it was easy to do that. Not easy, actually, but by comparison, because there was a United States Supreme Court that you could go to and say, please develop national standards on defamation, libel, and so on. Today, if you want to do the global public forum, where do you go? And a lot of times uh, when I talk about this, people say, well, that, that's really kind of the end of the discussion, because there is no United uh, global Supreme Court, and there never is going to be one. And the answer is, just because it's harder doesn't mean we shouldn't do anything. And in fact, there's lots more there to work with than we thought, or than a lot of us thought. 
And we have to make a kind of inventory of our tools and forces that we can draw on to try to uh, overcome censorship that's improper around the world in the global public forum. And of course, there's Article 19, which interestingly is not in any American casebook on uh, the First Amendment. It's kind of a wonderful thing to, to uh, see. And we have, of course, the UN Commission, even though it has no real powers, it might be something we would think about strengthening. Then we have the treaty bodies, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, and wonderful Catalina Botero, whom I've interacted with and I think does great work and thankfully has been protected against the efforts of Ecuador and some others to try to limit their freedom. But the, the regional treaty bodies might be the way to go. And one question for this group, of course, would be, is that really the best example of where the work should uh, be focused over the next uh, decades? So we need to strengthen that. We need to protect the internet against forces that would subdivide the technology and make it national. Um, so we need to do a lot of things like that, and I could name some others, obviously. But then we also need to maybe step back and reconceptualize how we approach all this on the global basis. In the United States, the way that we developed freedom of speech and press was to, was to say we're a democracy, we're committed to a democracy. In a democracy, you have to have the opportunity by citizens to discuss issues. It follows, therefore, that the government can intervene, and, and so on. It started from a premise of democratic government. When we say to, to countries around the world, I find this particularly true with China, when we say, you know, you should respect freedom of speech and press in your country, and the reason you should is because you should believe in democracy. Uh, it follows that these things, it doesn't really sit very well on a lot of countries uh, to make the argument that way. And when you say, you know, you're violating human rights, they also get upset about that. Now, I'm not saying that just because people get upset we shouldn't uh, push uh, these kinds of freedoms. But maybe there's another way into the problem that would help us make some progress and we can move from there. And my thought is, and we're trying to work this out, I don't have uh, uh, as much as I could, would like to be able to say about it, but I think it might be useful to start from the fact of the global economy. If we're going to have a global economy, certain things have to be done in order to make that economy work. There has to be a certain amount of transparency, openness of government, openness of information. And so the logic would be, we start from the premise of a commitment to global economy. Now let's talk about what follows from that. And that may not get the hate speech problems, the subversion, subversion of government, seditious libel. We'll get to those eventually. But let's start with some basic changes in the uh, world. And that brings in then opportunities to invoke world trade agreements, the WTO, one of the most successful international organizations, uh, foreign direct investment, bilateral treaty, uh, uh, trade agreements, uh, and arguments like uh, I heard uh, recently in Brazil made uh, that, you know, Brazil, uh, the United States in the Pacific and in the Atlantic is negotiating major trade agreements, the TPP, which all of you know about, and the US-EU trade pact. That would be 65% of the world trade right there, if those two are open. That would be an incredible change in the world trade scene. You better get your act in order, your house in order, economically and everything that goes with that in order to protect your economy in the world economy. And that means infrastructure like roads and so on, but it also means a certain amount of openness, transparency, et cetera, et cetera. So again, an argument that's made linked to economic uh, development. And then, of course, there are uh, arguments that people make. Uh, you know, you, if China really wants to move to a non-foreign export uh, society, uh, econo economy, it's really got to develop some kind of openness so people can be innovative and invent things that people want. And, and that's a, a theme that we should do more research on. Okay, so uh, maybe we need to reconceptualize where we start. 
Just a few comments, finally, on the capacity issue. As I said, it's distressing. It's nice that there's a rise of global media uh, and a, a sort of strengthening of that, uh, but it's also depressing that many uh, traditional media are uh, 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 depleting uh, the resources for this. I've argued, Nick's argued, uh, other people, a wonderful report from here uh, has argued that we really should think about public funding uh, as we need more reporting, both about lo very local things but also about global. And I've proposed a world, American World Service uh, idea modeled on BBC and, and um, uh, that whole regime. Uh, this has no chance whatsoever of going any place in the United States. I mean, even even the smallest amount of money would be uh, would be uh, impossible. But um, but it's a, a thing. But there are other things we should do. I mean, I wrote a piece some a year ago on Al Jazeera should be uh, carried by cable companies. And public policy should uh, should insist on this. There are various things to do to try to get more uh, capacity in the uh, world. Last thing I would say is that um, uh, universities, uh, we think, have a real role to play uh, in both trying to understand the world better in traditional scholarship, which we're working on, but also in the sense of filling the need for more journalism about the world. And uh, so we're beginning to think about that. It wasn't quite as skeletal as I set out uh, to be. Uh, it's the problem of being enthusiastic about the thing you're thinking about. It's, it's completely forgivable, I think. Uh, so uh, there it is, and, and I'll come back up later and ask you some questions. Thank you very much.